When I hit the button? <laughs> it's red. That's not bad. No way. Two o'clock. All right, now I can start. Welcome, everybody, to the Principles of Configuration Management. Yeah, you've been looking forward to this. Who doesn't love themselves a little bit of configuration management? Maybe a lot of you. We'll see. Maybe you'll like it more today, or maybe less. We'll see. I'm going to start, though, by trying to get everybody on the same page in terms of some of the basics with how the configuration system works, talk a little bit about some problem areas, and then offer some of my own recommendations, and then finally wrapping it up with everybody's, probably most of you, your favorite subject, configuration validation, and that's the overall scope for today. You can leave any time, too. That's fine. I am Matthew Tift, and I am a developer at Lullabot. I have been doing Drupal for a while. I've been part of this camp for a while since the very first one in 2011 in various capacities over the years. And that's why I'm especially happy to see new people coming as well as all of you familiar folks. Um, I'm also involved in one of the Drupal core star shot tracks, or no, that's not Drupal CMS tracks, uh, the dashboard track. And I'm a yoga teacher, which will come into play a little bit later today, we'll see. And you don't have to like take screenshots if you don't want to. All of my slides are on my website right here. I'll put that URL at the end as well, just in case you're like, wow, those are some awesome slides. I really want to see them up close because those screens aren't big enough. So we'll start with a little bit of an overview. Now, I've been giving talks about the configuration system for a long time, and, you know, it usually just packs the room, which is, I don't know why. But so every time I do this, I feel like, who's going to show up for a configuration talk? I mean, really, nobody really wants to know. They just want it to work. But, you know, people come, they want to hear about it, and we've been using it for a while, and I've been talking about it for a while. And why that is relevant is sort of, I've sort of come up with my own way that I like to explain it. And I think of configuration as types of things. So configuration then, things like views, content types, image styles, all these things on your screen, those are the types of things. And then on the other hand, we have content, the things. So the things are things like articles and basic pages and taxonomy terms, and those sort of all go under the content bucket. So again, this might be very basic for some of you, but I just want to be clear that we do kind of div divide things in Drupal like that. Uh, it's not quite the universal CMS on the back end, in a sense, you might say. <laughs> Because it, we end up having these different sorts of personas. So how many people in the audience view themselves as like site builders or developers or people that are like writing, that might touch the configuration? And then we over have, we have people that do more content things. Are any of you, does any of you show up? Not really, like my wife. Oh, okay, we do have some. I do both. You do both, all right. You can do both. I do both too. Pretty much. All of us do both, I think, to some extent. But uh, the point I like to make is just like some people, they don't really need to know about the configuration system. It just sort of needs to work for them, and that's totally fine. It doesn't have to be appreciated by everyone. And there are in Drupal, basically, if we want to drill down a little bit more, two different kinds of configuration. We have simple, and then we have these configuration entities. So with a single configuration, that always means there's exactly one copy or version. And then configuration entities, you can create zero or more. So uh, Gabor had this nice uh, 
visualization of how there's overlap between all of this. It's not an exact split in all cases. So things like nodes are content entities, but then things like views are configuration entities. So they're both under the sort of entity circle, if you will. And then we have these other things that are configuration that are outside of entities. And then we have all sorts of other things in Drupal, like path aliases or like the state system and all these other systems. So there's lots of stuff, but it can get kind of confusing. So in general, you know, we sort of think about content and configuration. And then on the configuration side of things, we are especially interested in managing that configuration. And what that means is maintaining quality and consistency and control and repeatability. These are the kinds of things we're aiming for with configuration management. I think in general, I would say configuration management is a process for establishing and maintaining consistency. So you do something in one environment and it's the same in the next environment. And configuration management in other parts of the IT world can be quite complex. Uh, lots of these funky, you know, graphs and whatnot if you look around on the internet. And in Drupal, I like to simplify things down much more into my favorite slide dev to prod and this when we were designing the configuration system was what we ultimately decided was what we wanted to solve as a problem because we tried solving all sorts of things in the early 2000 or 2010s or whatever in terms of what configuration might do but ultimately we narrowed it down to this idea that you have a development server like your laptop or something you want to push it up to a production server and you want that code or that configuration in this case on the production server to function just like it did in your development server and we wanted that to be rock solid and for, I don't know I feel like we did an alright job and let me explain using another one of my favorite subjects many of you too might like this JPEG quality huh anybody love to talk about JPEG quality well, it makes a good example for configuration, actually anything in the configuration system does really, but you start with, there, and this could really, this is sort of chicken and an egg thing, but I sometimes think of this as like files, database, files. And the big thing with configuration was that before Drupal 8, we didn't really have files, but now we have files for our configuration. We had things like features, and that wasn't always totally rock solid reliable so right now we put configuration in different places but for example when we're talking about JPEG quality like any module the configuration is in the config install directory and that's only read when you install the configuration and in that in in this system.image.gd.yaml has JPEG quality which everybody again I mean, everybody probably knows about this. This is, this is fun. But when you go to install your Drupal site then, it reads from that file and then it pulls it into the database and then in the database, JPEG quality in a different form. But the same thing, JPEG quality 75. And then you go to the UI and there it is, JPEG quality 75%. And that ranges from zero to 100. And Higher values mean better image quality, but bigger files, which leads to the big arguments we're always having, like, oh, we need to have higher JPEG quality in core, <laughs> or other people who, you know, we want to keep it low, so I'm not going to make any judgments where you stand in this contentious debate. I'm kidding, okay, it's just JPEG quality, it's configuration, it's fun, but maybe you want to lower that down for whatever reason contentious or not, so you change it in the UI, and then you go and you look at admin config development configuration, see the difference that the staged configuration, which is the configuration in your files, is 75, but you change it to 50, and then you can visualize the difference, and then if you want, you can export that configuration back out into files, and then push it up to your dev server. So, 
that's kind of the life cycle of configuration. So this is, again, maybe kind of basic to uh, lots of folks and other folks maybe have never thought of it that way. And, you know, again, this is sort of my take, but this is, I think this is pretty factual in terms of how it works, but, you yeah, know, I'll stop, I'll stop. So one other thing I want to say about configuration is that we also have config schema, which describes configuration. And I believe when we first added this, it was because configuration can do things like tell us what, or we needed a way to say, tell us what kinds of things needed to be translated. And actually, while we were working on the configuration system, the folks who are working on the translation system, the multilingual initiative, Gabor came over and he's like, hey, we need to know which things need to be translated. Like, we don't have to translate JPEG quality, but we do have to be able to translate the maintenance mode message. So then we came up with this idea to do schemas, to describe things, and then this is of type text, and then the translation system knows, hey, this kind of configuration needs translations, and others do not. So that's one example, but we have these config schema files, and I'll, those will become more relevant later. But 2015, this is your little history lesson. We released Drupal 8. Dot zero, dot zero. Everybody's super happy. Everybody came and saw my talk and my favorite slide. Thank you, Martin, for taking this picture. If you want to take a picture of me in this slide. No, 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 the other one. The other one, I love it, I love it. I'll put it in a future talk if I ever give it again. Me in here. The other one, so you yeah. took a picture of Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it, oh, I love it. Good, good idea, Mike. Me and this one. And no, 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 this one. Yeah. No, next time different angles. Yeah, different angles, me and my favorite. <laughs> so you might be like, why does he like this slide so much? It's just, it's just a dev, dev arrow prime. That's the big deal. I mean, that's all you need to know. The talk's over. I mean, really done, right? Well, no. We've got problems, right? Everybody's got a little problems. Because some people are like, dev prod, what the, I mean, I have a more complicated use case. I want more. I mean, that's immediately what happened, right? Everybody said, no, 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 I need more. I've got an enterprise site. I've got a really complex system. I need more. So for example, maybe you said, all right, well, I have a multi-site setup and I'm using a configuration system and I have some modules that need to go to site A and B and C, but others, you know, only need to go on site A and C to be enabled. And then I have configuration and some of it I want shared among these sites and others. I just want this configuration to go there. And this is actually, I just adapted this from a real life site that I was working on where I drew them how their current site was set up and I changed the names to the not make fun of anybody, but I encounter this kind of thing all the time where people try and do very complex things with the configuration system because they have these real use cases where there are things like, oh, I want to do stage file proxy on my dev server, but I really don't need that on prod, so that one doesn't have to be enabled there, and I want to do path auto or on all of them or something like that, right? So we have these different use cases that are like way more complicated than dev prod. And if you have these kinds of use cases, like a lot of people do, because a lot of people use Drupal for complicated things, I still think it's helpful to keep in mind that basic idea. Because every time we've tried to take the next step in the Drupal community, it's been a little tricky. So there was this CMI 2.0. How many of you remember this? Couple, a couple. This was an initiative where we tried to, to take, uh, go from our huge step forward, which is the repeatability of dev to prod, to being able to handle all these complex things. But the thing is, this initiative never really quite went anywhere because everybody's got their own unique use case. So we have this robust configuration system right now, and people are using it. And some people are abusing it. And some people are doing things however they want. And that's great. I mean, that's what, that's what it's there for. So I have some ideas, keeping in mind some of those main principles. And it all, for me, starts with, and I'll bring this just back to the first 
value of Agile Manifesto, which is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So I might recommend some processes and tools here, but really whatever you do for your approach should be geared towards your team and what those people are comfortable doing. Because complex workflows work for some folks and they don't work for others. And, under, and underlying all of this for me, my yoga teacher, Basically, I want to do these kinds of things with a configuration system, you know, out of kindness for people. So they're not like annoyed by their configuration and getting all annoyed by, oh, is it this site or that site? They're not like breaking things for the next developer or they're not just being like, oh, we got to have this new thing. So I'm going to add this, even though it makes everything more complex. That's what I think about generally. So let's start with say, okay, I'm the only developer on this website and the configuration system is just annoying. How come I have to use the configuration system? Why can't I just build my site? Nobody else is using it. Well, if you think dev to prod, then you don't really need to do this because you're not doing dev to prod. So if you have the, the, let's say a low traffic site, a single developer site, a site without a dev stage process, you don't need to use the configuration system. It can just sit there. You can just use Drupal and like people that are going to be using Drupal CMS, the Drupal Starshot stuff, eventually like they're not going to want to think about configuration and moving environment environment. We're going to be having some people that just want to use it. They don't need to use it, and that's okay. Just back up your database, please. You know, <laughs> And at any point, you could export your configuration from the database. So that's easily solved. You can just you know, be content with life and ignore the configuration system, and you won't hurt my feelings or anybody else's, I'm sure. But let's say we're going to get a little more complicated, and you say, I, okay, I want to be able to have different modules enabled in different environments. Pretty legit use case, right? So you might be reading Drupal Planet, which I recommend, and seeing articles and lots of folks recommend using something called Config Split. And you might go to their web page and be like, oh, the canonical examples to have the Devel module enabled and have a few block placements or views in the development environment, and then not export them into a set of configuration to be deployed. Ooh, that sounds cool. Config split. I want to do that. Okay, I'll do it. Now, how many people have used the config split module in the room? All right, keep those hands up. Config split. How many of you have experienced problems using config split? <laughs> okay, so there we go. This is pretty common when we talk about configuration. People that use this, they start off reading that and they're like, ooh, I just want to do this thing. And then it balloons. Because there's an issue is that the config split, for it to be truly reliable in the same way we have dev to prod, it, has, it requires infrastructure that just doesn't exist. And I'll talk a little bit more about why. But if you just read the first part of that config split description. It says configuration management works best when it's importing and exporting a whole set of configuration. However, sometimes developers like to opt out of the robustness of configuration management and have a superset. So, right there, first sentence on that page is saying you're going to lose some of the robustness. So again, what does your team want? What do you want to do with this? What's, how long term does your site need to last? At Lullabot, where I work, we do something called architectural decision records that are all available publicly at architecture.lullabot.com and those are our ideas about recommendations we make for all of the sites, all of the Drupal sites that we work on. And we just share those. And if those happen to become the thing that everybody does, we're fine with that. And then we just don't need to do those anymore. But these are things that we do. And one of ours says, use settings, not split. So we have, this is the ADR, a screenshot from that page that describes how 
Uh, some teams leverage config split as a general purpose override tool and the presence of config split often leads to teams using it in production improperly causing maintenance and development issues. So that's what we've found at Lullabot. I mean, granted, we've, had, we've made a lot of money of people coming to us saying, oh, my configuration system's all messed up. We, we did this crazy thing and we come in and we look at it and this is often part of it. So we recommend not using it. So if you just want to enable modules in some areas, we now have this in part of core where you can use config exclude modules, which is a setting that can be used for enabling modules in some development environments in the other. So in your settings.local, which uh, Mike and Ella loves, uh, and was just talking about how everybody should use one, you might just say, here, in my local site, I want devel, I want stage file proxy, so easily, done. You don't have to use config split for stuff like that. That's in core. Another problem. You've got configuration that you've deployed in one environment doesn't match with the other environments. Now, oftentimes, this comes from people editing configuration by hand. Because they're like, oh, I just changed this one thing in this file, and oh, I can just go over here and do this too, because I have to do it in like eight different places. Now, when you do that, you are bypassing the configuration system, saying, I don't need that. And sometimes that works, and a lot of times it doesn't, especially if we're using again, if you're just in Mike's talk, I'm sorry to keep talking about you, Mike, but I'm, I guess I'm like hyping up your talk by saying he's talking about how we should be using these tools that tell us that we don't have to be, uh, uh, we, we don't want to be making these silly code errors in our code editors and then our servers have these CI processes and if you, do, if you edit config by hand, sometimes it just has bad consequences and then you run into some things where it's just like a coding standards things where it just like moves the language down eight lines or something like that, the lang code. But other times I've seen field settings that totally broke content in certain ways. Some people edit permissions thinking they remember it but screw that up and then suddenly they have real security risks on their site that you don't get caught otherwise. Uh, sometimes people will move blocks around and I don't know why they don't use the configuration system, but it breaks pages that they didn't know they broke because they just changed something in one thing and then when they got imported, the configuration system's like, what's going on? This is broken. So there's all sorts of interesting issues. If you go in and change cache settings, by, cache settings, cache, <laughs> cache settings by hand, then you might have some performance area error that you introduce that you won't know for quite a while until you start seeing your lines going up and up. So I just recommend using the configuration system. How easy is that? You can use the UI or Drush to export your configuration and oftentimes, and I know it just sounds so silly and simple, right? But just make sure you use the configuration system if you want to do configuration management. I'm not saying this just to be like clever or cute or like selling the configuration system. It's just like, hey, it usually works pretty well. And I think if you do that, it's kind of just being kind because I don't know how many, maybe I could do a raise of hands again of people where you've like, okay, I'm gonna sit down and work, I got my JIRA ticket now and I'm gonna sit down and work on this thing, pull down the latest site, latest database, and then you start working on something and you do your first config export and there's a bunch of other configuration in there, things you didn't change. Anybody experience that? There we go. So, use the configuration system and you don't run into that as much. It just still happens like <laughs> because modules change things and then you alter content or something. You know, there's different reasons, but for the most part, if you use it, it helps quite a bit. So there's another problem where you exported with Drush, you use the configuration system, but it still doesn't work on the import. Now, this one is sort of unfortunate in a way, but the solution in, in some situations is you have to import configuration twice. And we have another architectural decision record at Lullabot where we say we define the order of the steps when building a Drupal site. And again, something we do 
on all of our sites. We, Lullabot's been around for 20 some years with Drupal and we do a lot of Drupal, we, we're a Drupal agency. I can just put it that way. Um, and we have this order of steps and it includes in here config import twice. And that is for a, a variety of um, reasons, but sometimes, and, and honestly, a lot of times it goes back to the config split module because something gets enabled, but then the configuration doesn't go in because it happens before the thing gets enabled, and then you have to enable it again to pull in the configuration for the thing that you enabled. But bottom line is, if you run it twice, which seems kind of weird to do it twice, oftentimes that will fix those problems. So there is a Drupal core issue that says, this is kind of dumb that I have to do this twice. And there's a lot of people out there who are like, yeah, we should really fix that, but that's kind of a hard problem. And there's more fun things to work on, I guess. So until somebody, I mean, we're, you know, volunteers, build Drupal people, build Drupal, whatever, you know, if you want to work on this issue, it's right there. I got a link to it in my slides that I can share with you, uh, that's fine. Um, until then, I recommend do it twice. Another problem, people make mistakes. That's okay. We all make mistakes. So one of the ways you can help your configuration process be bulletproof and repeatable and robust and consistent and all those other words from that original sign is to always check. So if, and I'm it's like a, it's turning like an ad for our architectural decision records, you know, and I think about how many of these I have in here, but these, this is a link to it again. These are all public. This is just like, hey, this is how we do things. Uh, this is how I personally do things when I'm working with different clients, whether they're big universities or whether they're nonprofits or whoever, you know, everybody that's using Drupal, I say, if it's a big site, um, and you have a CI/CD process, a continuous integration, <coughs> continuous development process that you check that your configuration is in the same state. So I just grabbed this little snippet from one of my current processes, which just basically does this little config status and it says, is the state different? And if so, then you say, the config status or the config export doesn't match the database and you show that it doesn't work and basically you fail the build. You know, you say you did not actually use the configuration system and therefore it, therefore when the site pulled it in, there's actually now we have that difference, you know, the JPEG quality that we all love and know that it was like between 50 and 75. We had that kind of situation where the files don't match the database. So by adding a little process like this to your build process, you're always reminding folks where exit one, you know, like, oh, my PR environment didn't even build. Um, and if you don't have a PR environment, if you don't have a build process, obviously you can't always do that. But if you're, if you're, this is basically similar to like doing locally, I do this all the time where I'm like config export, nothing, config import, nothing, okay, all good, right? I know I'm good. It's that kind of same thing as that's kind of what this is checking for, but then you don't have to do that manually as much. So, you know, again, just be nice. You know, I feel this is like stealing from other people. If I don't check my own work and don't export my configuration or don't do a config status. So be nice. Anyway, so let's review. Here's a few things that I recommend. Export your config locally avoid using config split, import twice using your CI process, and then run some tests to check your configuration. So those are a few of the ideas. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to get into too many more details about those, but another big problem is just basically like configuration is not valid. And this can happen for all sorts of other reasons. But in Drupal, we are working on this process problem with another one of those really exciting, really exciting areas that people love to work on called configuration validation, right? 
Right? Yeah. Everybody excited about config validation? Yeah! Fully validatable. That's right. I didn't even say that right, but fully validatable. <laughs> so you can validate your own configuration. I was thinking about this a little bit during Preston's talk today because say you want to like create a he's talking about like creating a custom admin ui in react or something like that right and you want to like that requires configuration but the react people building in the react site they don't want to have to like create something in drupal right they just want to do it in react so the way that works is they have to have some sort of api where they can create their little React app that exports something, but then they might get it wrong and it might break the site. So, but if you validate the configuration before it gets imported, then it can say, oh yeah, what you did, that JPEG quality on your site, you know, you have correctly put in a number there rather than like a text field or something. But I mean, you might be thinking, okay, who cares? Who cares about config validation? So I'm going to use another example, form validation. So we have this newish thing called config target. And right now, um, I was, well, when you write forms in code, you right now you might write a validate function, a validate form validate function. So let's say you want to make it so you if your site name, if you try and change your site name to anything other than foo or bar, you would validate the form, and then when somebody submits it, you would say, okay, is it actually valid? And if not, then give them a warning, right? And this is how you would write that in code. So that kind of thing, if I tried to do foo with a capital F, and it'd be like, nope, the site name must be foo, foo is invalid, that comes from this little code that I wrote, don't, under don't worry if you don't understand the code. This works for that form in Drupal. Everybody following me? Like, I'm, I'm doing this for the form. But with config validation, you don't, you would, rather than doing that, you would add this config target and then you would say system.site name, and then you add these things in your configuration in your schema.yaml file, remember that from earlier, that says constraints, and then you would just say choice, foo, or bar. So what this does is it moves the logic from the form API where it's like just in Drupal, like you're doing that form validation, that's a Drupal form, Drupal stuff, to the configuration system with these constraints. And then that allows other people, like that React developer writing their custom UI, to also have constraints. And they would be like, oh, I'm going to do some custom thing and send configuration to Drupal and they call, you know, they call the site awesome, but you're like, no, oh, it's got to be foo or bar, so that won't work. The configuration system doesn't just show the error on the form, but it does on the form. It also shows it in the API response. So there's a lot of different constraints that we have now, right now, such as config exists, length, not blank, reg, reg x. Um, these. I think ultimately, like this one little aspect of config validation re results in simpler forms. It was, it, was, it was fewer lines of code to do that. Um, it, it has uh, the validation in not just the Drupal side of things, but in that universal CMS aspect. It also has a, uh, I would say, like um, a better user experience in terms of developers. So. Something like the Automatic Updates Initiative. Have you heard of that? Yeah, Drupal's working on this thing where Drupal will just you know, chug away in the middle of the night and automatically update stuff, right? We don't want to spend our time automatically updating stuff. But when you do uh, automatic updates, there might be things that modules introduce or whatever that break everything. So without form configuration validation, we wouldn't have a good way to check that people are actually sending in the data that really fits 
to that works. So currently, it's only uh, targeting right now automatic updates is only targeting Drupal core, and partially because that's where most of the people doing config validation are working. We're, you know, moving through Drupal core. Um, automatic updates right now, it does work. Um, or I'm not sure if it works with contrib yet. I think that's an option. But right now, it's it's not necessarily validatable unless that module that's providing the contribution, the contrib module providing contrib, comes with form validation. But since most people haven't even heard of form validation, you know, most modules are not providing this yet, because this is like this is one of those processes that that's going to take some time. Um, config validation is also like key for recipes. We heard Martin talking about recipes earlier today if you were in this room and recipes they don't work if we can't validate config so if we have a recipe that's putting together all kinds of you know fun ingredients but they don't work together then the form the configuration doesn't validate that allows the recipe to roll back and say let's not break the site the config is invalid those are some of the use cases and you know recipes is definitely the new hotness so if we want that to work really well we need all of the configuration in drupal to work because as i just said and now this slide is later it can fail when multiple recipes are combined so you might have multiple recipes because a recipe contain other recipes and you put them all together as long as you're ultimately ending up with valid configuration, it works. But if you're not, it doesn't work. So config validation allows recipes to roll back and say, hey, that's not going to work. Let's not import that. It also, as I had mentioned a few times, like with that React example, other whatever front end JavaScript, things like JSON API, GraphQL, they are going to be able to be even more robust when it comes to validating configuration, not just validating content. There was also a decoupled admin UI um, initiative a few years back. Ultimately, they wanted to do the kinds of things that I was talking about where they, want, they wanted to build this JavaScript only admin UI for Drupal. You know, the th kind of thing that could like auto save all your typing and things like that, all the JavaScripty stuff. But ultimately, they couldn't do it because basically they didn't have the configuration validation. So while we talk about API first a lot in Drupal, it's I think it's pretty clear that if we look at like Drupal 8 to Drupal 11, it's way more API first in terms of content and less so for configuration. We still have a way to go. We're still working on that aspect of things. So that's why the JavaScript admin UI was, was really sort of hampered by this lack of configuration validation. And it's still a tricky thing. I'm actually working on a Drupal site right now that has a decoupled admin UI. And we don't even try this kind of stuff because it'll, well, we can't validate it all. It would take a lot of work. If we have configuration that's validatable, it also could allow for a reliable config split someday, once we all have modules that are validating the config. But it's a slow process. So this is a page that you can go and visit right now to see the exact status. There's a module called Config Expector that you can use to check your modules to see if they're validatable. And right now, on average, we're like about to, the relative progress is about 42% of all of our configuration in Drupal core being validatable. There's certain, you know, different, uh, different things are moving more quickly than others. There are multiple issues that are sort of um, split up. Or these are both meta issues in Drupal. One's about sync. Simple config, we saw that earlier. One's about config entity types. So there's a few of us that have been like working through all of these issues, making all of the configuration in Drupal core validatable. 
anybody who wants to help because I mean who doesn't like working on config validation you're welcome to join you'll find my slides and I'm gonna be realistic I know it's not gonna be a lot of you but you know we might have a really big table at that uh, unconference tomorrow if you want to learn more about config validation, there's somebody who's more excited about this than me, and his name is Wim. He just gave a great talk to a packed room at uh, DrupalCon in Portland. Um, honestly, like I could not believe how big that, how this huge room was full of people listening to Wim talk about config validation. He gave this talk. Uh, if you want to learn more, it's really good to get a sort of up-to-date status. Um, and maybe you'll, maybe you'll start including this on your next project if you want to look into it in your modules. Because, you know, really, if we had configuration validation, the world, I mean, it'd pretty much just be fun. But that's about all I have for today. Those are my slides and how to connect with me and that kind of thing. But we have a few moments for questions for anybody else who would like to ask a question. Mike and Ella. Yeah, so if you have a module that has some configuration, you should have a schema file. Yep. Is a schema file without the, I forgot what the, what the new. Constraints. Constraints. Is that still validatable? Like, let's say I've got, you know, configuration that's just checkboxes. There's nothing to really validate. So I don't see any reason to have constraints. Is that, is it, is it, my module still be validatable? It depends on what you want in in there. So if if you're like there's one that says like um, like like in the in the case of a checkbox, if you're saying like I want to be able to select this checkbox and it has to be a Drupal user. The config might be able to tell you, like, here, these are the possible users in the Drupal. But what if there's none of that? Like, do I have to have? No, you can just put fully validatable on your config, and you can mark it as validatable and say just text, and that's good. Oh, so there's a key that goes in the schema that says fully validatable. That's the piece of information I've now. Yeah. Um, I'm always tempted to like go jump in and show stuff, but it never works out well in real life. Um, but yes, there, where was the thing I was going to click on? Just, I was just going to kind of show an example. Um, does that work to open a link here? I'm just in my browser. breaks things. Why did it break things? This is why I don't click on things. <laughs> I don't know why. I totally lost my screen. Uh, weird. Let's try this button. Is it there? There it is. Um, I was just going to like pull up a random issue that has been solved. And and just give you an example of what that looks like. I suppose I could have just pulled a uh, pulled up some actual code. But this one, like this says, this constraint is fully validatable for text.schema. We just want it to, I mean, we also, um, we can say like not null, we could say a range or things like that, but we could just mark it as fully validatable and that's saying like this is validatable. All right, so that fully got fully, I can't say it, fully validatable. Basically, you're just marking that schema as I've done my due diligence, and only constraints on the schema are what is listed in here. Yes. And if there are none, then there are none. Then there are none. So it's basically a flag. Yes. You check, check, you check. Yes. Yeah. So it's sort of on your honor, and this is. This is like these issues get to be really long. Well, some of these get to be like really long. This is even like simple config where um, we're going through and sort of, you know, some of this is, is uh, 
there, there there's different opinions on like what should be what it what should be allowable values here what shouldn't be allowable values but you get really you know you can get really into the weeds in terms of like should we allow users or text formats or should we be going and looking this up or just saying it can be whatever there are different variations and then there's this whole thing about null versus blank and uh, yeah that's a big issue but i don't want to get into that right now but yes there's there is some sense of like you have to kind of understand what you're creating with your configuration and your module and what really might actually break things, which requires then understanding what would not work well or what kind of thing do I really want here. So Wim's talk talks all about getting into that more and like how you search through Drupal core and how you like figure out what are the possible constraints and that kind of thing. And it, it's a way more hands-on. My talk is just this overview of the configuration system. And so I'd recommend that for more details. Wilbur. When you talk about uh, validating configuration, um, tell us about um, how we would sort of interact with this. Would, would there be like on the configuration page, a validation page that says, Here's the here's the configuration on your site that's validated, and here's the configurations that not valid. You would get like output like that. I mean, would it would it give us an error message of like, sorry, this doesn't work. Your it, configuration's invalid. Yeah, it would be in in. Uh, eventually, we might have something like that, but right now it'd be more like when you import it. Um, that it would say that this is not valid for a different reason. You know, like right now, it might just be, you know, we, we have different sorts of constraint. I mean, I guess you, I shouldn't use that word, but we have different things of saying, we, Drupal will tell you, I don't know how to import this configuration. It's broken, that sure. kind of thing. Um, this is just sort of another layer on that. But a lot of times, like this should be invisible, like yeah. with the recipes. So imagine, this is more like you might interact with it when you're going to install Drupal CMS, this new thing, which is geared towards the ambitious site, uh, no, ambitious, not site builder, ambitious marketer is the new persona we're targeting. And that that person would interact with it, like maybe they've, they've grabbed one of Martin's awesome recipes and they've grabbed somebody else's recipe and they try and pull both of those in then it would just say at that point, like, you can't do this. And then it would tell you, like, specifically why some people are going to interact with that on the level of, okay, I want to go fix that because I am in control of that configuration. And other times it's just like, no, I'm, I don't want you to break your site. So your, your schema is telling me don't do this, and I'm going to listen to that. One more question. Once we have this information, then we can start yes. using it to make good decisions. Yes. Don't, don't import this. Yes. I mean, honestly, there are a ton of use cases for this. Uh, I don't want to try and get into all of the different, but I mean, it's really like the sky's the limit in terms of like thinking about like this universal CMS stuff. Like, basically, if you just want to talk nicely through an API and you want to say, hey, I want to do this thing and you want to import config, you might want to send it. And this is just like other checks, just to say like, hey, did you do it right? Just like we might do PHP CS or something, maybe kind of like that, where it's like, you broke the Drupal coding standards, I'm going to fail. Similar kind of thing with the configuration. Last question? Do you have any opinions on things that uh, straddle the content the configuration divide, like the static menu overrides, or like the web forms that I don't totally understand the question. It's about it's about the content and config. Yeah. So you have like a content editor that you want to make web form edits on live. Oh right. But then you try to import that and then if you have someone overriding that if you don't ignore it or okay. then you might have that to a view that's you have up your static and you overrides. Yeah. In general, like we just when I work on sites, dev to prod 
which means if somebody is editing configuration on prod, it's going the wrong way. So do you tell your content editors they can't make web changes, or? Well, there are different ways. There, it depends on what you're doing, right? And it depends on your own team and how they, and what you want to empower with your editors. But to be really safe, um, you know, changing configuration on production doesn't work. So there's there are these uh, modules that you can, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, that config, yeah. config ignore, yeah, where you can basically make it so they can't make any of those changes. But yeah. I always tend to lean towards don't do anything that can or might change configuration on production because it breaks dev to prod. And I'll end on that note. Thank you for coming very much. <laughs>